Yeah, so no, I was on a, I was on a call about Firestorm, and yeah. it all got kind of exciting, and we were making plans about you know potential premieres yeah. and places, okay. international stuff, and great. It, so we all got a bit carried away. Oh, that's um, brilliant! But that sounds really good. Yeah, no, it is, it is really good. It is really good, but it's just been one of those days where it's kind of yeah. everything's happening back to back, and then wow. documents have come through that I've got to proofread by half past six. And, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Sorry. I mean, uh, uh, do you want to do this later or no? No, I want to do this now. I want to do it now. Look at you. You're keen. I've never seen you so keen. <laughs> it's almost like you're enjoying yourself. I am always keen. I really enjoy these. I know it's fun, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's not as like we're happy. It's, it's all we can. Oh yeah, <laughs> listeners, who can? Who, I, there's nobody even listening. No, I have to tell you, I, I am feeling quite uncomfortable. I'm rather stuffed as it happens. I sat here like Jabba the Hutt at the moment after an enormous lunch. What have you eaten? Well, I started with the. Sounds rather ridiculous. I started with quail's eggs. <laughs> I know it sounds like some Dickensian meal, doesn't it? Yes. Uh, and then mule frit. Lovely. Yeah, and that was what it. Was, was the mule in an in an interesting? Uh... Well, it's in a white wine sauce, of course. I mean, you know. Oh yeah, lovely. A bit of garlic in there. Oh, of course, there's a bit of garlic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit of parsley excellent. as well. Very nice. Yes. And then at the end, did you have no? A I just coffee? finished with a, with a coffee. Actually, just a little cappuccino, just to, just to finish off the meal. Brilliant. Oh, that's an exciting day in anyone's book, isn't it? That is amazing. Yeah. I'm so jealous. I I, I, what did I eat? I had a fry up this morning. Nice. Uh, and that's it. So God, I mean, this is fascinating. Just, isn't just it? been just been going. Anyway, yeah, we should yeah. get on to well, the we podcast, really shouldn't we? We've got much more important things to talk about than what we've just yeah. had for lunch and breakfast. Absolutely. So, what podcast is it? It's Pod Eight. Here we go. Hello, partners. You are listening to the Jerry Henderson podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Cheetah here. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Uh, well, here we are again, here Richard. Here we are. I know. Now, do you know what I've been thinking? People, people are listening in their droves. Well, you'd hope so, wouldn't you? Which is, I, I'm so grateful. It makes me very happy yeah. to know that there are so many people enjoying it, and we keep getting. I don't know about you, but my inbox, well, obviously your inbox is the same as mine because the podcast email goes to both of us, but you, every day there's emails coming yes. in, right? very exciting. So that is really lovely. But what I think we should do is now not introduce ourselves in such detail. Wow. Because I think I think a lot of people who are listening are going to know now. Yeah. Because we keep saying it. We do. It's true. So we can just do that thing at the start where we, we go, uh, hello, I'm Jamie Anderson and... Yeah, we don't need to know about you being, you know, the son of the late legendary Jerry Anderson, uh, uh, you know, the protector of his legacy and moving forward with new productions. We don't need to know any of that. And I don't need to say I'm Richard James, uh, you know, actor, playwright, uh, played Orin in, in, in Jerry Anderson's Space Prison. Olivier nominee. Yeah, don't need to mention any of that. Currently an awful auntie. Yeah, no, no, that's it. That's it. So we don't, I nobody just say, either. I'm Richard. And I'm Jamie. Yeah. Done, job, fine. Job done. That's the new intro then. Yeah, great. Perfect. I like it. It's, it's much snappier, isn't it? It is much snappier if we do exactly that. <laughs> uh, so anyway, here we are. It's the Jerry Anderson podcast once again. Yeah. News, emails, oh. um, listener emails. Obviously, the randomizer. Yes. An interview. An interview which you conducted, Richard. That's true. Yes, just today, in fact, I uh, I made my way into the old into the old smoke. Uh, yes. And I met with uh, well, I'll say I met with Lisa Mazimba, who everyone out there in in the real world will know as the BBC uh, arts correspondent. Uh, late of Newsround as well, which uh, I, think I remember Lisa good, on Newsround. A good ten years, I think you would say. Yeah, yeah. But it's a lovely, wide-ranging interview in which he discusses uh, key moments in his career, his love for all things sci-fi, his love for all things Jerry Anderson, uh, and also a little tidbit about how Jerry Anderson also inspired the pop group, or rather rock group, Marillion. Really? Did you know that? I 
I had no idea. Yeah. I, mean, I had a little bit of wind there, sorry. Well, can, <clears> you can edit but that I had, out, you? No, no, I'm going to keep that in. <laughs> I, I had no idea about Meridian. Yes, they, well, there's a, there's a great story which, which you can hear a little later on. Now, I remember... I can't wait. We would love it if you out there would get in touch with us with all your questions, comments and thoughts about this here podcast. You can email us at podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. That's podcast mm. at jerryanderson.co.uk. Please do. We read every one and we try and answer as many as possible. Yeah. But as we've said, yeah. you know, the, the email volume is is brilliant. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. also difficult. It's a champagne problem, isn't it, Richard? Is it? I wouldn't know. Is it a champagne problem? In what way? Well, I think so. As in, it's lovely. Right. And it's a good sign, but it means we can't read them all out. Why is that a champagne we... problem? Well, because it's a bad thing, but it's a, a sign of it being good. Isn't it? Well, that makes absolute sense. <laughs> You mean it's sort of light and bubbly and a little... Over- oh, stop it. Go away. You're being very difficult oh, on purpose, uh, aren't anyway, you? Yes, and also, of course, people have been getting in touch on Twitter and telling us what they think about the podcast, which is lovely. So you can tweet us uh, at Richard N. James or at I'm Jamie Anderson. Uh, for example, uh, David uh, tweeted us and said that uh, he spent an enjoyable hour listening to the Jerry Anderson podcast with Jamie and Richard, discussing all things Anderson whilst deep cleaning the bathroom. Uh, well... I mean, if you're going to have to do that, then what better way to... Although I'm slightly worried that he actually enjoyed it because of the hu- the fumes uh, from the maybe, products. Maybe. Uh, he said he yeah. could have done with the, with the help of uh, International Rescue. But he really enjoys the celeb interviews and thinks they're fab. Well, absolutely. So if you want to take a listen to the previous podcasts, you can hear the likes of, um, well, David Graham, um, Sophia yeah. Miles, Lee Sullivan. Sophie Aldred. Yeah. Uh, Gary Newman. Yeah, I think uh, that you've named all of them at this well, I think stage I well, in the proceedings. Days, but we have uh, uh, Lisa Mazimba in this pod and many fantastic uh, interviewees, interviewees coming up in the future, which is uh, Yeah, exciting. future interviewees, mm. including Wayne Forrester, voice of new Captain Scarlet, yeah. uh, and uh, general uh, voice artist extraordinaire. Yeah, of course, I will know as uh, Rocket the Frog from the uh, Fimbles, of course. Of course you will. Yes. And others will know him as a Roly Mo. Indeed. As well. That's right. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, 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 exactly. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and also we've got Robbie Stevens and Nick Briggs yeah. and many others. Lovely. Uh, all kind of in the bank and ready to come along. And also we'll be doing some special Space Precinct related interviews. Gosh. As we approach <gasps> the, the DVD release in November. Ah, oh, so exciting. I mean, yeah, there's so much to come, so you definitely should subscribe. And if you're enjoying it, then rate and review as well. Yes, yes. we're loving Thank reading you, your Thank you. yeah your reviews on iTunes and so on. They uh, they fill us with hope that it's actually a good thing to do, don't they, Jamie? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Sometimes you do wonder, don't you, when we're <laughs> rambling and talking nonsense like this? It's true. So uh, I think it might be time for some um, some news, perhaps. You think? I I think so too. Yeah. So uh, uh, Gordon Tracy, could you tell us, please, if it's news time? Hi, Gordon Tracy speaking. It's time for the Jerry Anderson News. Right. right. News. news. There's news, always news. news. There's I mean, always Jerry Anderson well, news. Well, it is incredible. I mean, you know, Jerry himself died in 2012. Uh, his last production was in, what, 2005? And yet there's still Jerry Anderson news. It's very heartening, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. A right. testament a testament to the strength and uh, uh, sort of timelessness of the Jerry Anderson legacy. Yeah. And also all of the efforts every, everybody's involved in keeping yeah. this going. And also the, the fans. It's great. Who keep this alive. Absolutely. It's just, it's just brilliant. Where would we be without them? Well, uh, I'd be probably sitting outside in the sun right now with a pina colada. But the, you, know, you would. Uh, and I... I I think I'd be changing the cat litter tray, so I'm I'm extra right. grateful today. Yeah. Okay, a little insight into your world there. What's Thanks the news? Everyone. Well, it related to the cat litter tray. I've actually got a new kitten, Richard. Oh no! Yes, this, okay. she's called Di- right. Diana. She's called, uh, and she's Diana. very sweet. And she's currently asleep in a, a shoebox in the kitchen because she's decided that shoeboxes are the best thing ever. Right. So I'll tell you what. I will post a picture of Diana the kitten yeah. on um, the show notes page Great. for this episode at jerryanderson.co.uk forward slash podcast forward slash pod eight okay and now of course we will require regular updates as to diana's progress in the next uh, absolutely few weeks. Excellent. yeah we can certainly provide that Good. um anyway on to actual jerry anderson <laughs> news and not kitten news 
Uh, there are some lovely new articles up on the Jerry Anston website this week, including some uh, behind the scenes uh, stuff about props being reused in various shows from UFO, ah. some Captain Scarlety stuff, and lots more on the way. We're working really hard on the website to bring you new and interesting content. Yes. So do keep an eye on that, jerryanson.co.uk. Always worth a visit. As we mentioned last week, uh, Space Precinct mm. is getting a complete series DVD release. Now, Richard, you missed out on the announcement because I wasn't sure I was allowed to re- record it when we recorded, That's and so right. I had to do a, an awkward insert. No, it, it was seamless, Jamie, seamless. A seamless insert where I <laughs> shouted, stop the podcast. Uh, anyway, so look, it's very exciting news. It hasn't been released since two. Gosh. Yeah, I think was the last DVD release. And not as a box Space set, Precinct. was it? It was no, not as a box set. Volumes, I think. Yeah, and now they're really difficult to get hold yes. of. So finally, in November, the whole thing plus some cool extras and stuff, which we have not yet announced, yeah. but we'll be announcing in the coming months. Yeah. Um, to celebrate the annou- the the announcement about the upcoming release, we've reduced the price of Space Precinct Reloaded, the which comic. Is, which oh yes, the released. comic. Brilliant. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to see some kind of prequel new comic adventures, then pop over to the Jerry Anson store and pick up a copy of Space Precinct Reloaded. It's now five ninety nine down from seven ninety nine. Great. To celebrate all things Space Precinct. Yeah, that's brilliant. I am so chuffed about that, as you can imagine. I mean, what's so nice about it, quite apart from my involvement in the series, is that it plugs that gap in everyone's Jerry Anderson collection, doesn't it? It, exactly, mine too. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't have all the Space Precinct DVDs, so sure. to, to know that that's finally going to be there yeah. is is very exciting yeah, indeed. It is. It's great news. Um, on the theme of old news, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it is old news, mm-hmm. I just realised that we hadn't really communicated to our American friends uh-huh. out in the US uh, and our Canadian chums uh, that uh, The Lost Worlds of Jerry Anderson, mm-hmm. which is a collection of pilot films like Space Police, The Precursor to Space Precinct, yeah. Uh, the Day After Tomorrow or Into Infinity, which is a sort of Space 1999 universe thing with Nick Tate and Brian Blessed. Um, some other bits and pieces. The Investigator, a very weird puppet and human mashup from the 70s. Yeah. Very odd. Yeah. Is that your cat, Richard? <laughs> That's my cat just walked in as you're talking, yes. Oh, it's very cute. Yeah, it's Hello, Kitty. Down here, yeah. This is a very cat themed <laughs> episode. <laughs> anyway, The Lost Worlds of Jerry Anderson was released a little while ago by MPI Media in right. the US. Which is great. Uh, and so people in the US, if you want to see these Jerry Anderson curios and lost pilot films, then you can pick it up oh. uh, from somewhere near you. Oh, I don't know, yeah. Target? Is that sort of place in the US oh, where they sell no DVDs? Idea. But I, do, I love the sound of a Jerry Anderson curio. It sounds like yeah. a, a corn-based snack, doesn't it? <laughs> mm, pickled onion flavour. Uh, <laughs> he loved pickled onions, actually, interestingly. Or not interestingly <laughs> at all. Anyway, it's about as interesting as the kitten news we had earlier, to be honest. Probably is, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, anyway, look, if you want to check out The Lost Wells of Jerry Anson, there's a UK version, there's an Australian, New Zealand version, and a North American version. So, go and grab them, have fun, and enjoy some Jerry Anderson bonkersness that didn't quite make it to the screen, yeah. or certainly not as they were when they were pilot films. Yeah. And... Well, as if that wasn't enough... As if it wasn't enough. I mean, dear, oh dear, I'm exhausted already. Uh, you, you know this uh, live theatrical interactive experience thing that's happening, the Thunderbirds well, Beyond the Horizon show? I know about show. as much as everyone else does in that it's well, happening at some point somewhere. November it launches. Uh-huh. I went and had a meeting with um, Richard Lewis from Limelight, who are sort of producing the show, really. Yes. Yeah. Um, and obviously, like everybody else, there's kind of been an announcement in the ether about what you might be doing, but there's not a lot of information. And the reason there's not a lot of information is because an interactive theatrical experience takes a huge amount of construction, you really. They've got a, they've, they're actually building a theatre for this Gosh, thing. Gosh, that's amazing. Uh, and then they have to kind of write and rewrite as they test it. And yeah. So right now, there's not a lot to show, which yeah. I completely understand. Well, that's frustrating for the fans. I can't tell you any details about the show itself because that kind of misses the point. Yes. The whole point is you go in and you're immersed wow. in International Rescue's world. But what I can say is I, I spoke to Richard at length. He's a lovely chap. He really loves Thunderbirds. He really gets it. Great. And uh, actually, my excitement levels about the, the show have been ramped up. Yeah. Uh, through meeting him, so I, ah. I think I think fingers crossed we're all in for quite a treat. Now, but so yeah, more news as we have it. That sounds amazing. So, what's the sort of basis is this, of this? Are we, are we heading back to the sort of I don't know, nods to the classic series or to the current um, ITV series or the 
the movie even? I mean, they they describe it as a hybrid. Ah. Um, I don't even think it necessarily has to be seen as a hybrid. I mean, it, it you know, th- there are key Thunderbirds elements, International Rescue, yeah. uh, Penelope and Parker, yeah. the vehicles, um, the hood, those yeah, things, lovely. which are which are exist in both <coughs> classic and new. Yeah. And I think those are the elements we're going to see built, that, that this thing is built around. Wonderful. Um, but I'm going to get Richard in for an interview on the podcast in the next couple of months. Uh-huh. So we will hear from him ahead of time and hopefully get some exclusive tidbits. Yes. But, um, yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm heartened and excited. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. There you well, go. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, well, we look forward to, to more news on that. Um, and yes. that brings us to the end of the news. Yeah, but, uh, any offers for our wonderful listeners? Oh, sorry. Yes. Good. Yes. Excellent. There, there is. There. There's a. Uh, there's a big giveaway. In uh, fact. Are you giving away some uh, packets of Jerry Anderson curios? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, Corn beef flavour, I hope. Corn beef flavour as well. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, we're not giving away that. We're giving oh. away something much more exciting. We're giving away uh, two hundred pounds worth of Jerry Anderson prizes. Amazing. Uh, and to to be in with a chance of winning those, you can go to jerryanderson.co.uk forward slash giveaway, uh-huh. uh, and there you can gain multiple entries by doing all sorts of different things. Right. Um, Are they the more legal? entries you get. Of course, of course they're legal. Excellent. What are you talking about? Um, the more entries you get, the higher the chance of winning. So uh, go over there after this podcast and and get winning, fingers crossed. Fantastic. Is that the news? That is the end of the news. Brilliant. Well, di- well, that was quite a lot to digest there. So fantastic news. Great uh, offers there. Uh, fantastic yes, news on lots. that space recently reloaded. I love that comic. Now, just give us a reminder of who uh, produced that and uh, designed it and drew it and all that sort of stuff. Chris Thompson. Yeah, Chris Thompson produced it and wrote it and coloured it and um, Connor Flanagan drew it mm-hmm. uh, and Andrew Clements edited it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, a bunch of people who love Space Precinct created Space Precinct Reloaded. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a great it's a great little thing. And hopefully, if we get a chance, we'll do more of them in the future. So this is kind of issue one. But uh, it was a it was a real labour of love for everybody involved. Yeah, that's great. Uh, following the news that Space uh, Space Precinct is getting its uh, DVD box set released later in the year, uh, we had a few people tweeting this week. Uh, Mikey Brett McStay said, "Oh my God, yes, this was the defining series of my childhood. I had all the toys too." Uh, Alec Deacon said, "This was my childhood. I love Space Precinct." Dave Cooper says, "Will it be available in the US?" It already is available in the US, Dave ah. Cooper. <laughs> it's been available there for ages, which is part of the weirdness of the way licensing and broadcast yeah. and all that sort of stuff works. Yeah, it is strange. Daniel Dudley says, will Richard James be doing an audio commentary on the DVD? I oh, think we should make that happen, really Richard, don't so? you? <laughs> I What I want to do is get you, me, and your lovely wife, Charlotte, who is editor on the series, yeah, yeah. together around a microphone and to do some commentaries, even though I'm nothing to do with it, really. I was a gopher, you were. technically, yes, on the, you must have on made the series. Me a cup of tea at some point, I would think. I'm sure I did. I'm sure yeah. I must have bossed you around. I was like, definitely, oh, definitely. So, I, you know, I feel like I have some kind of insight. Yeah, not as much as you, that. of course. That'd be great. That, that'd be great. Let's see if we can arrange that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and more generally, uh, we have uh, Tone720 who tweeted us saying, uh, choring today. So he's doing his chores as well. Fired up with the Jerry Anderson podcast and started binging. Uh, so far, he's up to Sophie Aldred's episode. Uh, didn't expect to enjoy Sophia Miles' episodes as much as I did. Great work. Well, that's nice, isn't it? We've had a lot of nice feedback of that, and so far, it's so lovely. Yeah. We just had that really lovely casual chat. Yeah. So, uh, exactly. yeah, if you whether, whether you love or hate that 2004 Thunderbirds movie, yeah. then give it a listen. I yeah. mean, it might soften your hate towards it if that's the way you feel <laughs> yes okay great so uh well that's a, f- a few tweets uh, do remember you can get in touch with us at uh, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk uh, with all your comments thoughts uh and uh ideas you might have for the podcast any questions and we'll try to answer them uh, and in the meantime do share rate and review us on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Spotify, wherever you happen to be listening. Uh, Do share it with your friends and leave us a a review if you wish. Uh, Any more listener emails, Jamie? Oh, there's loads. I thought there might be. (laughs) Shall we dive in? Loads and loads and loads. Uh, Yes, um, you, you start, Richard, after you. All right. So as ever, we have had an awful lot of emails we can't unfortunately read them out as you can imagine uh, but we do pick uh, one or two choice ones for you uh, this one for example is from Aid Swatridge he says hi Jamie and Richard here's a question for you 
I heard or saw somewhere once, I think, so, you know, hedging his bets at the moment. Feeling really certain there. Yeah. Uh, that the BBC and ITV often shared props from TV series and some Anderson-related props appeared occasionally in Doctor Who. Uh, or was it vice versa? Last week, I was watching the new Tom Baker Doctor Who box set of season 12 episodes, The Ark in Space, and I noticed on the wall in the space station some familiar orange computer tape machines on the wall. They looked suspiciously like the tape machines you used in the Fact of uh, Fab or Fib Facebook Live quiz recently and were in UFO as well as Captain Scarlet. Am I right? Could these be the exact same tape machines? Do we know about that, Jamie? Well, yes. Ah. Um, I'm pretty sure they are. Um, it's very difficult to you know, be very precise because a lot of the things were commercially available at the time and, you know, coloured a little bit or whatever right. or transformed or turned upside down and whatever to disguise them. But I'm pretty sure they are the same ones that were in Captain Scarlet UFO and then Ark in Space. Ah. But interestingly enough, yeah. on the Jerry Hansen website this week, yeah. we have articles about where uh, Jerry Hansen props ended up in other productions. Right. How interesting. So, Aid, I th I'm pretty sure that question is answered directly in the article brilliant and you can see how much recycling of props was done but i mean props and models re recycled what a joe 90 uh, jet yeah ended up in doctor who yeah. at some point you know I i'm sure just, a space, just the way it works a space 1999 lamp ended up in one of matt smith's tardises i'm sure uh, yeah, the, yeah, the style of lamp, absolutely. Yeah. And um, so Terra Hawk ships ended up in Alien, <laughs> right. uh, or, or Aliens, yeah. sorry. Um, I mean, it's yeah, it's amazing how much stuff is shared. Great. Uh, because it's so so labour intensive to put this stuff together. So if there's a perfectly great looking prop yeah. or piece of set, then it's going to get reused. Absolutely. Uh, Aid says, P.S. Keep up the good work. I'm 59 years old and still love watching the shows. I have all the annuals and comic reprints and many of the original TV 21s and Countdown comics and lots of craft models too. So I'm I'm still a big fan. Well, thank you, Aid. You clearly That's are, Aid. Brilliant to hear, isn't it? Fantastic. Yeah. Really awesome. good. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, head over to the Jerry Anderson website, Aid, and you can read about reused props. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I've got one here from Angelo. Mm hmm. Hi, guys. Oh, well, He's hello. avoided the. Uh, the Richard and Jamie yes, issue he's there. Neatly sidestepped the whole alphabetical order thing there. First, he wanted to say, I am loving the podcast. Great. I listen to them over and over. Wow. It's like it's like having a conversation with friends with the same love for Jerry Anderson in my car to and from work every day. Another commuter yeah, listener, which great. is lovely to hear. Yeah, that, we, well, I, I hope we make it go quicker. Yeah, 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 keep an eye on the road. Yeah. Oh, no. Um, I was wondering if you guys could get Big Chief Studios in as guests who are makers of all the new replica Thunderbird and Captain Scarlet figures. They are amazing. It would be great to hear from them about the aspects regarding these, making these figures, what's coming up, etc. They did this on a James Bond podcast recently, and mm. it was really insightful. Mm. Keep up the amazing work and keep the legacy alive. Cheers, Angelo you from bet. Australia. Thank you from Australia. Wow. Antipodean listeners, yeah, Richard. Isn't that thought. great? I, know, I love that. Yeah. Uh, well, I think Big Chief would be great guests. Yeah. Um, I'm going to email Mark at Big Chief immediately after this podcast right. and ask him if they'll come on board. Nice. So, Angelo, thank you for the suggestion. That's a great one, and we will follow up with that and do our best. Yeah. And that James Bond podcast sounds interesting, doesn't it? Might give that a listen. Uh, <laughs> Don't yeah. drive people no, elsewhere. No, no, no. Uh, now we've got a, an email from Ian who says, Richard and Jamie, I like the sound of that, uh, I happened mm. upon the podcast a couple of weeks ago and have been enjoying it very much. Hurrah. Nice to hear. I was raised in Scotland in the 1970s, so missed the original runs of many of the, many of the classic shows, but remember watching Thunderbirds and Joe 90 during the summer holidays or early Saturday mornings. My cousins were 10 years older than me, and they had a Corgi Thunderbird 2, which had pull-down legs, and a pod with a tiny yellow Thunderbird 5 in it. Now, might that be Thunderbird 4? I think that's probably Thunderbird 4, isn't Spot it? the deliberate mistake. Uh, I also yep. seem to remember they had a Corgi Fab 1 that fired missiles out of the front. Uh, they were out of my auntie's house by the time I was 10, so I had a great time playing with all these cool toys. I seem to remember they also had one of the ships from Space 1999 as well. Uh, anyway, it's funny how people remember the toys, isn't it? I love it. Uh, anyway, yeah. I hadn't thought about Thunderbirds for a long time, and in 2015, as I was getting into board games, I discovered that the great game designer Matt Leacock of Pandemic and Forbidden Island fame had designed a brand new game for the 50th anniversary of Thunderbirds. It has beautiful miniatures of all the Thunderbirds and little pegs representing the Tracy brothers as well as a miniature of the hood. In one of the expansions, they introduced tiny miniatures of each of the 14 pod vehicles that fit inside TB2. 
Now in the game, you basically take the role of one of the characters in the series and have to get the various vehicles to various locations to take care of disasters before the hood can carry out his evil schemes. The box art is brilliant, all the cards in the game have photos from the classic series. I've not heard you mention the game yet, but it might be fun if you interviewed Matt or the folks at Modifius Publishing. Thanks for considering this. From Ian. Well, Ian, uh -huh. I'm glad you love the game and I'm glad you've got those great memories. I'm pretty sure those toys would have been dinky, not corgi, though. Uh, not that I'm, I, I mean, you know, yeah. easy to forget these things. Yeah, and as a kid, it's... you're not really that interested in yeah. the make. You right. just want to play with the blooming toys, don't yeah. you? Uh, so, yeah, we, look, we we uh, were big supporters of that uh, that game by Matt Lee, Cock and Modifius. Um, we, uh, we supported their Kickstarter campaign they ran. Great. And gave me lots of promo and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and the game is available on the Jerry Anderson store. Oh, Would you believe well, it? Everything, all roads lead to Rome and all questions lead to the Jerry Anderson store. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe it would be nice to, to get Matt uh, on as well. I mean, it, I just love that there's such an amazing variety of people we can talk to about yeah. Anderson stuff. They're everywhere in all walks of life. Yes. Game designers, entertainment correspondents, yeah. Musicians, singers. Yeah, I mean it's it's brilliant. It is amazing. So uh, yes, it is a great game, and it's it's one where you you it's a cooperative game, isn't it? Where you play against the board itself, you play against the game. Ah, uh, so it's quite a fun one. Yeah, it does. Anyway, fun. highly recommended. Yeah. In fact, I've got a copy on my shelf. Great. I don't know why I'm telling you because you can't see it, but no. it's just up behind. But me. I'll play that with you next time I'm round. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah let's break, do that. It'll break the awkward silence, won't it? <laughs> Give something to talk about. Yeah, it's probably best we do that. Um, anyway, look, Richard, I've got another email. Would you believe it? Yeah, they've been trickling in, haven't they? I know. This <laughs> one's from David Tremont. Do you know David? Now, I know of David Tremont, yes. What do you know of him? Well, he's from Weta Workshop, isn't he? He is from Weta, yes, absolutely. Uh, that's all I know, because I've heard him mentioned in, at various points in the, uh, the he... Fab Live broadcast that we do on Facebook and uh, occasionally so... on the... David is a, is a lovely human being, mm -hmm. uh, but he's also a very talented model maker uh, and a Thunderbirds obsessive. I think that's fair. I'm sure David won't mind me calling <laughs> oh, you obsessive. Yeah. Um, Where would we be without them? Exactly. Yeah. And I know that David listens to the podcast in the workshop at Weta while he's building models and stuff. Great. So careful, David, don't you know? Yeah. pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. You missed a bit, work. David. But he's, he's lovely and brilliant. Uh, he says, hi, Jay. Oh. Do you notice there's not even a Richard on there? Yeah, I'm yeah. sure he's thinking of you, though. Oh, well, okay, <clears throat> hi, Jay and Richard. I know my friends. Um, have started to listen to your podcasts and love them. I enjoy listening to people talking about shows that mean so much to me. Thunderbirds is the driver behind what I do now. I've worked with many effects people of my generation that were also inspired by Thunderbirds. I thought that I would share this, uh, though I probably told you already. Oh, yeah. Obviously, the listeners won't have heard. No, didn't. I've no. worked as a model maker in the film and TV industry for 40 years and a hobbyist for more than 10 years of that. When I was young, I loved to make things out of whatever was around the house. My father built us wooden toys, and for me, it was the magic of watching him create something from nothing. One day, a new show started on TV, Thunderbirds. Watching that changed my life, and from then, all I wanted to do was to build models. Also at that time, Doctor Who started, and that gave me a sense of adventure and imagination. So watching my dad build stuff, Thunderbirds and Doctor Who sent me on a lifelong journey that I continue with passion. Hmm. When I first saw Thunderbirds, I exploded at my dad with excitement and begged him to make me Thunderbirds toys. He did, and the image I have is those wooden toys. Uh, they went on they went on so many rescue missions around my backyard. Nice. My earliest memories of Jerry Anderson would have to be either Stingray or Thunderbirds. Our TV was very limited with the reception, so I had to watch these shows at friends' places. Us kids would run the kilometer kilometer home from school, throw our bags inside, hi mum, and then continue down the road just in time to watch the latest episode of Thunderbirds on a friend's TV. Wonderful. Many thanks, David. Oh, that's great. I'm sure that's a memory that nice? shared by lots of people rushing home to watch their favourite episode of whatever Jerry Anderson show might have been on. That's lovely. But I just love that it, it's taken him on a 40-year career yeah. path that he's still passionate about now. That's so thank right. you, David, for the email. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Uh, Scott Sadler writes, Hello again, Jamie and Richard. You can answer this question on the next podcast, uh, if you like. Uh, all right, well, we'll try. Uh, I went to the fab world of Jerry Anderson last year at the Space Centre in Leicester, and as part of the theme of the weekend, they showed a screening of Thunderbirds Are Go, the movie, in the planetarium uh, on one of the afternoons. And I was wondering if it would be possible to do that for this year too, but maybe with a different screening. I also went to the Friday night screening and a con of Trapped in the Sky, and I figured that would be an amazing show at the event. Uh, so what do we think about that? 
Uh, well, Scott, it's not up to us. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, but I will Fantastic. email the organisers of the Fab Worlds of Anderson, which is happening this September at the National Space Centre, uh, and make that suggestion. We've still got the Trapped in the Sky thing that we did. So that had an introduction as if it was being played on uh, ATV Midlands for the first time. Yeah. We had an ad break with some uh, uh, some ads from the time, mostly voiced by Peter Dinerly, who was Jeff Tracy oh, great. in the series. So yeah. it was a nice little package. I-, I will definitely send it over, but I can't guarantee anything because it's not our event. But yeah. I will be there on the Sunday, work permitting. Aha, uh-huh. very good. Nice. So, see you there. Thanks, yeah. Scott. Excellent. Um, Richard, I've got another one. I mean, this will have to be the penultimate one because we, we are going on a bit. Yeah, now. we are a bit, aren't we? Yeah, that's fine. Um, this is from Dave from Leicestershire, interestingly enough. Ah. Not far away from the Space Centre no, or indeed. in the same county as the Space Centre, so. in fact. Hi, guys. Oh, well, hi. He's done the same thing there and avoided the names yeah, issue. Yeah, clever. Very nicely done, Dave. <laughs> First of all, congratulations on the podcast. I'm really enjoying it. Oh, Dave, thank you. Nice. Um, do you think Captain Scarlet would make a great live action, big budget movie? I believe the story of the battle against the Mysterons would hold well in today's world. What do you think? Keep up the good work from Dave in Leicestershire. Oof. Dave, it absolutely would. Would it ever? But, I mean, these things are very devilishly difficult to get off the ground, you know. I mean, has it ever been mooted? Uh, the whole yeah, multiple, multiple yeah, times. Right. I, I think any one time, somebody somewhere, probably probably two or three people somewhere mm. are mulling over some sort of Jerry Anderson reboot or remake. But the path from that point yeah. to actually getting the thing into production and beyond yeah. is is so long and fraught with difficulty, it's it's crazy. Yeah. So it would be a great idea. Um, if, Dave, you happen to be a multi-multi-millionaire yeah. with a with a checkbook yeah. that you'd like to write a big check uh, for, and, then we could... And crucially, if there's a part in it for me... Of course, and, and you want Richard J- James to be yeah. Oh, I could do Captain it. Black easily, couldn't I? Absolutely, cool. yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the um, the little beard you've yeah. got going on at the That's minute. Right. It would be totally appropriate. <laughs> uh, yes, then, Dave, please do send a cheque. Uh, t- no, uh, it, it, I would love it to happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and maybe it will one day, but there's nothing currently on the cards as far as I know. Mm. So uh, that's not a very useful answer, is it? But uh, yeah. a lovely idea nonetheless. Yeah, exactly right, yeah. Uh, back on Twitter, 60 Minutes With... Uh, tweeted us to say I grew up watching Jerry Anderson TV shows Supercar was my first and the Jerry Anderson podcast is informative entertaining funny and essential listening well we've got to put that on the uh, on the little promo haven't we I know yeah. I'm I'm going to take that little clip and put it on the yeah, on just next that. trailer just that yeah it says yeah, uh, yeah. I've been a subscriber since episode one which is lovely to hear so yes you can subscribe uh, and that you means, should subscribe. Indeed, that means you get uh, notifications every time a new episode appears, so you can hear it first. Uh, so do subscribe, rate, and review us. And I have finally one last email here. This is we've from only Lee. got time for one more, yeah, Richard. This is from Lee Homer. So we'll squeeze this. It says, uh, "Hi, Richard and Jamie." It does not say that. It says, "Hi, Jamie and Richard." Right. <laughs> well, whatever. He then goes on to say. Having made that ridiculous faux pas, uh, I just want to say thanks for all the lovely, entertaining podcasts that you put out each week. Uh, I loved watching all of Jerry's shows growing up, and it's always a treat to hear new interesting facts and memories about his productions. As a kid, I used to have a hobby drawing my own comic books, including one I created based on the whole fantastic mythos that Jerry created. I called it Hawk 209. Sounded great when I was 12. Sounds pretty good now, to be honest, Lee. Yeah, I quite like it. Yeah, uh, and it was basically the adventures of a base and its wonderful machines drawing elements from Stingray, Space 1999, Captain Scarlet, etc. to form my own stories and memories. I sadly don't have them now, uh, although thinking about it, Firestorm comes close to what they were about. Yeah, interesting. Oh, interesting. I owe my love for science fiction to Jerry and his team, and I love how you're both keeping his legacy alive. Best wishes, and that's from Lee. Isn't that nice? Yeah, it's very nice, isn't it? Yeah, I, I wonder how many people created their own little kind of Jerry Anderson oh, universes yeah. when they were younger. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I even I, even I, I yes. sat around drawing, sketching of course. bits and pieces when I was a kid, you know, making up vehicles. I'm, I remember when Dad was, I think he was starting to do some pre-production on the ill-fated GFI, oh. which nobody is ever going to see because it only had one episode and it was terrible. Okay. Um, but even then I was drawing little ships and saying, yeah. you know, what about this, Dad? Could that go in it? Yeah, lovely. Uh, sadly, all of those drawings have now been destroyed. Oh, I know, isn't that terrible? Uh, 
so we'll never see them. Yeah. But there we are. I mean, anyway. Lee says, you know, uh, he'd like to thank us both for keeping his legacy alive. But actually, Lee, it's people like you that are doing that. We're sending us these wonderful thoughts and memories. You know, it's not just us two keeping uh, Jerry's legacy alive. It's uh, all... No, we couldn't do it alone. No, absolutely not. It's all the fans and contributors out there who are still collecting the toys, still watching the TV shows and still, still doodling away in their lunch break and creating new crafts and characters and so on. That's great. Thank you very much for that, Lee. Now, if you have a question for our future pods, you can drop us a line at podcast at gerryanderson.co.uk with your questions, comments and thoughts, and uh, we will do our best to read them out. Uh, so that's a bit of news. That's our listeners' emails. Yeah, we've done all that stuff. Yeah. What's which next? is great. Well, Richard, normally I go off and do the interviews, but this week you've done it. Yes. Um because uh, Lizo Mazumba has a restraining order out against me. It doesn't really. Just no, no. I, <laughs> I just got there first, that's all. You got there first. Yeah. Well, you got there through your um, very special connection. Indeed. So you? my wife, Charlotte, now works at the BBC and uh, sees uh, Lizo fairly often and uh, just uh, happened to mention to him that uh, we were doing this podcast and we were looking for interviewees. Uh, and he jumped at the opportunity, I'm very pleased to say. So uh, I packed myself off to New Broadcasting House uh, in the centre of uh, London's glittering West End, and he gave us the benefit uh, of a bit of his time uh, and a good few stories about how Jerry inspired him. And also, how, listen out for how Jerry also inspired the rock group Marillion. Right, so uh, could you uh, firstly give us your name and uh, what's your day job, please? Uh, my name is Lizo Mazimba, and I'm the entertainment correspondent for BBC News. Now, Lisa, thanks for uh, coming along to join us on the podcast. My pleasure. Today. Here we are sat in a studio at uh, BBC New Broadcasting House. Yes, you know, we've been here for a few years now, so it's um, almost state of the art, but it's um, yeah. nice and quiet and most of the microphones work, so <laughs> kind of fingers crossed. Fingers crossed <laughs> we don't have a technical hitch. Now, could you then just very quickly talk us through a typical day in your life? What does, uh, what does your day entail? It's that real cliche in that there's no such thing as a typical day, particularly working in news. I mean, I have various things set up often that I'm going to be filming filming or researching or looking into, but often you just get breaking stories that take you away from all that. So mm. sometimes I'll come in thinking I'm going to have a very quiet or straightforward day and end up getting out here in the early hours of the morning, having been doing something non-stop that we never knew was going to be happening. Right. Um, uh, and other times it does go, you know, ridiculously to plan. Uh, today's been a relatively straightforward day. I've come in and done some bits of radio. I'm trying to set uh -huh. up some filming that I'm going to be doing uh, over the next two or three weeks and a, a couple of meetings with colleagues about what we want to do on certain yeah. projects. So, but we're only halfway through the yes. day so far. Anything so, can happen. You know, anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, not always, not often, but a lot of the time something does just come out of nowhere and, and then do you, dominates your news agenda. And do you enjoy that? Do you thrive on that uncertainty in a way? Absolutely. I'm somebody who likes the challenges of daily news. I... I don't like big, big projects hanging over me from day to day to day. So I do like that kind of feeling that you wake up in the morning knowing not quite what's going to happen. Yeah. And also for so many things, because they're daily news stories, by the time it's gone out, say, on the 10 o'clock news, by yeah. that time of the evening, it's it's over and done with. Yes. And, you know, it's yesterday's, uh, you know, news, it's, yeah, it's yesterday's news yeah. and there'll be something new to deal with tomorrow. Yeah, so great. I think that's suited to me, my personality, yeah. to be honest. So... Uh, let me ask, what, what brought you here today? I don't mean the Bakerloo line. I mean, how did, how did you get to where we are today? Uh, well, I was very, very lucky. Um, I got to join the BBC through one of their training schemes. Before that, at university, I used to do lots of um, writing for things like the University Magazine and the mm -hmm. University Newspaper. And actually, while I was still at university, I was freelancing articles for The Guardian and The Independent and yeah. film and music magazines because I was one of those... Uh, I was, a re you know... And I mean this in a really positive way. Uh, you know, I was a really geeky kid. Yeah. You know, I was really into my, you know, into my sci-fi. And, you know, my dad used to buy me novelizations of big screen movies, right, even yes. stuff like Alien, which I don't think he quite understood. <laughs> yeah. How old were you then? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't old enough, I think, to have, by far to have seen it at the, uh, at the cinema. Yeah, but, um, but, you know, I mean, Alan Dean Foster novelizations and things yeah. like that. I, I even tried, to, I think, to read Isaac Asimov's Foundation oh, uh, yes. books. Oh, well, well, well was done. about eight or nine. I sort of made it through. I'm not quite sure I understood it, but I was like very proud. But yes, I've, I've reached the final page. Now, that's interesting. I mean, have you ever let that interest in sci-fi go or has it stayed with you? Because a lot of people rediscover it as they get a little bit older. I mean, certainly my 
case, you know, I was quite interested as a child. Then I seemed to put it aside while I got on with my life. And, and now it's, it seems to have come back into my life again. No, that, I think that's absolutely the, the case with me. It was something that was a big part of my childhood. And then when other things, responsibility, you know, A-levels, university sort of intervened, it took a slight bit of a, a backseat mm. simply because I was going in at that point in a different direction. You know, mm. I, I thought I was maybe going to be a doctor or you know, I ended up doing a, a law degree. And then I only came back into journalism, well, back, back into journalism, back into something that's allowed me to reconnect with science fiction in particular, mm. uh, slightly by accident in that uh, I'd, I'd been doing bits of writing and... Um, I applied to the BBC for a training scheme and was lucky to get on. But even at that time, I was I was involved in. We had a university television station as well. One of my memories is a group of friends doing a you know their own Doctor Who um, uh-huh. uh, story while we were uh, still all at university. And you know this is a time when Doctor Who was actually you know off air in the yeah, yeah. in the in the, the, uh, the, the, the yes. oh the yes. wilderness. Sorry, <laughs> oh, but that one's going to too, too much. So you know that that interest was always kind of like there. But I think. You know, the things that really excited me as a kid, I, you know, bizarrely, I was actually watching it by accident yesterday, looking for something else mm. uh, on YouTube and watching the end sequence of Star Wars, the throne room and all yeah. that kind of thing. And even watching, I was it's still, again, a real cliche, sends a shiver up my, you know, it's yeah. wonderful how emotive it was. You saw wonderful, the late Carrie Fisher there looking so regal at the end of the film, everyone sort of like, you know, marching up and, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and that, that wonderful moment where you weren't sure if, R2-D2 had yes. survived after the... It's lump in the throat there time, he was it? looking... All, and it was just... I just watching that. And, <laughs> and John Williams, I absolutely worship John Williams. You know, his incredible music there. And even though that's something that I first saw as a kid and must have literally seen hundreds and hundreds of times, it still has the power to make me just... Oh, Wow, yeah, yeah, that's how to finish a movie. And I don't think any would think will ever recreate the excitement for me, certainly yeah. in terms of film or any kind of medium like that, of the first time as a kid yes. watching the original Absolutely. Star Wars and that opening my eyes to, as to what cinema could do, how yeah. exciting it could be. And, of course, um, now, of course, you can download it and watch it whenever you want. You've got the yeah. DVD there, and it was a real yeah. uh, moment, wasn't it, that you experienced with you know a cinema full of other people, and that was it. Absolutely. I saw it time after time, mm. the, um, you you know, when it, I, I say that summer, I suspect I'm wrong on that because I think probably I think it actually came out in the UK at Christmas time, having been a summer right. hit. But um, anyway, I, I remember seeing it you know, over and over again. I got the John Williams gatefold vinyl soundtrack wow. and all Great. that kind of thing. Do you still have it? I don't think I do. There's a, <laughs> there's a load of stuff in uh, the attic of my parents' home, yeah, uh, yeah. which I should go through at some point. Um, the one thing I know I don't have, because I looked for it many, many years ago, was a wonderful, and I can't for my life remember me. People might listen might know. Yeah. It was a diary about the, oh, maybe it was Alan Arnold? Anyway, um, about the diary of the making of Empire Strikes Back, uh-huh. which I uh, got bought for me uh, as a kid because yes. I was so excited about that kind of thing. So is there a sense that actually your <laughs> career in broadcast and in entertainment in particular has, or in the, maybe even in the back of your mind, has, has been a way in to meet these people and talk to them, do you think? Or uh, it's, it it's, less the, it's, it's less the people, I think. It's uh-huh. just more just being the actual part of it and getting close to the process. I'm very, very lucky in that I... Somebody asked me the other day, do you get starstruck when you meet mm. lots of people? I'm thinking, well, you, you, it's not very helpful if you're this there gawping, like, and like just yeah. getting really kind of emotional if you if you meet somebody. And I, I'm, luckily, I don't think I do. I have a great admiration for the uh, for, for people who've worked in all that kind of thing. But even when I met, interviewed George Lucas for the yeah. first time, it was more kind of like, it's just really great being able to kind of ask questions to somebody whose work I've admired and... It's not always the case that you're yeah. doing an interview about something that you really like, but it's it's great when that passion comes um, comes across. And I think if I have a very positive quality to the kind of journalism I do, it's that kind of thing which you know was even more in evidence in Newsround in that you can't fake enthusiasm, you can't fake sure. passion, especially with kids. They yes. see right through Absolutely. that. And it wasn't like, oh, there's some adult just pretending to like this or pretending to like that. I remember the first time I interviewed J.K. Rowling, uh, author, of course, of the um, Harry Potter books. And um, I'd really enjoyed uh, the first and second book. 
And basically, it wasn't just another journalist sitting down to go, oh, yeah, you're doing this new children's book. Yeah. And children seem to like it. Tell me a bit about who is Harry. And it's about wizard school. It was, you know, not in the interview particularly, but we hinted towards, you know, I got all the stuff I need to generally about the growth. And yes. then after saying, I have to know in the next book, is this going to happen? <laughs> or I've got this theory about this character and like that. And, you know, from that, it was, kind of, it was evident that yeah. I, I really, really knew, yeah. you know, the stuff inside out and wasn't faking my enthusiasm yes. for doing something like Absolutely. that. So that was a, a, a you know, a great example of that. Okay, so you found yourself on the on a BBC uh, trainee uh, yes. scheme, uh, and what happened then? <laughs> oh, you'll laugh. My first, um, <laughs> I, I did the training for that. I actually found and put some stills online the other day. My first student film oh, uh, that, I, that I did. We all actually had to do a film at the end of the course. Um, to show what we'd learned and choose a topic. And, of course, I did a Doctor Who convention in Bristol, so yeah, I interviewed yeah. the late John Nathan Turner uh -huh. and uh, yeah. people like that. So even though I didn't see myself particularly maybe going, you know, down that particular route, and at that point, you know... The, the, and then something like an entertainment correspondent didn't really kind of exist in the BBC, but it was still right. there trying to poke its head above the parapet. Yeah. So I did that, uh, worked in regional news in the Midlands, where I originally come from yeah. for, for a while, and then came down to uh, London, uh, worked a bit behind the scenes on Blue Peter, and then the Newsround job came up, which, mm. you know, I think I've been so lucky. I've had, to me, the two absolute best jobs in broadcasting, mm. presenting news round. Yeah. What a fantastic Following John time Craven, of course. Uh, yeah, not directly following right, John right. Craven, but, you know, the, the great John Craven. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, really, you know, so many generations have so much to be grateful to him for. Yeah. Uh, making the news accessible, proving that children could be interested in yes. the news. And, uh, you know, I came after great people like Ch Julie Etchingham and great journalists like Christian Guru Murphy. Mm. And um, it was, uh, you know, it was really great. And, and I think... Almost slightly accidentally, I discovered my sweet spot in that, you know, I, I enjoyed doing serious stuff and could do all sorts of things, but actually I could immerse myself in doing all sorts of other wonderful things as well during that time on uh, news round Doctor Who returned under the stewardship of Russell T Davis. Yeah. Star Wars came back, you know, yeah. with the with the prequels. Not you know, not the greatest Star Wars stories out there, but, <laughs> but in your opinion, yeah, in my opinion. But you know, they were back, and I got yeah. to you know, I actually got to go to. California to Skywalker Ranch and yeah, interview wow. George Lucas and you know people who were in the in the cast mm. and um, I'm lucky in that it's the way it's continued through into this job as entertainment correspondent I'm still doing all that kind of stuff I'm yeah. doing Harry Potter stories now with Fantastic Beasts I'm doing still yeah. doing uh, you know Doctor Who stories you know we've got Jodie Whittaker coming up as the first mm -hmm. female uh, doctor on the on the show I'm, yeah. you know, I'm still doing you know Star Wars all this kind That's of right. thing so it's I've still just very felt, much of it, I still it? you know so I basically I think I've, I, I've ma managed to eke accidentally a career out of basically three things <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not bad but, you know, but yeah so very very lucky yeah. just I think I've just been so lucky to be in the right time at the right place with all these things Absolutely. that come along so uh, let's uh, let's turn around to Jerry, Jerry Anderson Jerry yeah and, uh, what if any what are your particular memories as a child, do you remember the first series you uh, you watched or became familiar I th with? I or? think my first series of things as a child, and of course, I never tied these things as being as being Jerry Anderson. No, they were just things that I enjoyed. Yes, um, I remember the toys. I think slightly more. Mm. Um, there was the now. I'm I will be corrected by people on the podcast if I get this <laughs> wrong. So if I get details wrong, it's it's me stretching back into my memory. Yeah. Was it a Fireball XL five, the Interceptor toy right. that had the the, 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 the detachable ah. yes, yellow missile that's at right, the, the top missiles. that you could like so. that? That's right. I remember. I think my older brother or friends might have had that toy because that I, I distinctly remember that. Although I don't really remember actually watching Fireball. I also remember the Shadow. Um, oh, the Interceptor. That was Interceptor. Uh, from UFO. Yeah, 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 was that from you? That's from UFO. Uh -huh. and, and I think there's one that had a, I'm mimicking my hand a, a, yes. a flip top thing that revealed missiles under. Ah, nice. Well, I think um, if I've got the wrong toy or if I'm conflating two bits of merchandise, yes, you yes. Know, please, please tell me. But <laughs> I've got it completely oh, wrong. And, and I, how dare I even mention these things? But uh, you might want to uh, stay yeah, off Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Day. I, you know, I remember that. You know, <laughs> or, you know, and then obviously Thunderbirds, the web thing from the, the music. All that. I, I, I remember sort of dipping in and out of that. Joe Ninety, I think because I was a, a young geeky kid that wore glasses I think I'm probably associated with yeah. um, uh, a bit more and you know Stingray but I think you couldn't be a you know, a child and not have some awareness of Thunderbirds, Stingray, yeah. uh, you know, all those kind of like shows. The one that I do remember watching particularly and again with, and getting the toys for uh, Space 1999. 
Yes. I remember the, the, the eagle. The course, eagles, yeah. With the detachable pod. Yeah, the because I think one did yeah. have the kind of lab inside or one that had things, That's you know. It. So I, I do remember the actual pod and the little pincer things you do to, That's right. to release it. And it was just a beautiful, beautiful bit of uh, yes. you know, bit of bit of design. A bit like the Millennium Falcon in Star right. Wars. It was just like you just looked like that and it just looked so cool. Yeah, now we've spoken previously to Lee Sullivan, who's an mm. illustrator and yeah. did lots of work on those sort of Jerry Anderson comic strips and so on, and he talks a lot about the merchandise he had mm. when he was growing up. He talks a lot about the fear of it, and particularly the smell yeah, of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I remember how the, the, you know, the, I think I had the white um, eagle inside, yeah. the, and just how it felt. It was made yeah. out of, so, it wasn't cheap plastic. It was made, it Absolutely. Like, you know, I, again, correction if I'm wrong, my memory is that it was kind of made of solid metal mm. like that, and just had this beautiful kind of design at the front. I remember, you know, me and my brother flying them round. I'm mimicking my hand flying yeah. through the air here. Yeah, yeah, you're very good. <laughs> uh, like that's that. And yeah, you know, they, they felt like really good bits of kit. Well, that's that felt, right. That felt really, it wasn't like, you didn't feel as a kid, you been sold a bit of merchandise or no. actually your parents had been you know persuaded to buy a bit of merchandise yeah. you felt like you had the genuine shrunk down version of something that you watched uh, on the tv that's right uh, i mean as for episodes I, i've been tracking my brain i, I remember obviously that the concept of it being you know it, you know the moon and all being ripped off right? yes indeed that's and right. like that the only particular episode i remember in detail was one where well, in, not in detail. It had these creatures with um, tentacles and eyes, and yeah. it was uh, a bit like the John Carpenter film They Live, yeah, where yeah. only one person could actually see the aliens ah. through their uh, disguise. And I remember that um, making a particular impression yes. uh, on me as a kid, just being a great episode and a great concept. It's funny. Episode. And, yeah, and to be right. honest, I do think I probably watched almost... All of space, nineteen ninety nine. But that, but you know, the details of lots yeah. of kind of what now happened as kind of as one. I remember the music. I've always been a great geek for music and yeah. TV themes. Um, the great Barry Gray. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. I mean, you know, the, the music was you know absolutely fantastic. It's funny you should say that because a lot of people, as you say, may not remember specific episodes, but there are images and scenes that mm. seem to burn yeah. themselves onto onto people's. It was. It wasn't brains. that I found it scary. No. just I found it really interesting. A great concept of this yeah. one person who was the only person that you know recognised that they had, this alien invasion was going on around them because everyone else saw them yeah. as as humans and I suppose that's you know that's a tribute to the imaginations of everyone you know involved they came up with these great concepts that yeah. you know but forgetting all the effects and wonderful work that was put on top they were just really good storytelling and I think yeah. that's the thing that makes the things have such longevity is that you had really good believable characters in good believable stories and that's yeah. what really made them absolutely fly. it's interesting you should mention joe 90 because i think jerry was particularly proud of joe 90 and mm. that it was more character based than yeah than no, absolutely you had real sympathy kind of yeah. like you know for him and the characters around him and him and his the relationship with him and his father that's right all that kind of thing so i mean you can tell you know, stories with lots of bells and whistles and all that yeah. kind of thing. But if you don't care about the characters at the centre, it's not going to last yeah. very long. And Jerry was very big on families, really. I mean, a lot of his series are based around, obviously, the Tracy family yeah. and Thunderbirds and even the you know the, the Spectrum agents uh, mm. headed by Colonel White, a kind of a family, Joe yeah. Knight and his father and so yeah. on. I mean, do you think that might be what sort of appealed to you in a sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, again, yes, I think so. I re remember with... Um, you know, Thunderbirds in particular, it was that wonderful team feel. Mm. And I was lucky enough, again, when I was at Newsround to go on the set of the live action movie, which, yeah. you know, splits opinion. I, yeah. you, know, um, you know, I, in fact, I was, I remember reading in a magazine, a, a screenwriting magazine, God, seven or eight years ago, about all the different drafts the script went through and the ideas and the concepts. And right. actually, what they were trying to do, you know, there was uh, worked you could really kind of understand it of like we wanted to be a young boy yearning to be like you know the rest of the kind of Tracy family in this wonderful you know uh, exciting thing a bit in I suppose in a way like Spider-Man Homecoming which did it very very well mm. which actually getting back to the root of what Spider-Man about it's not about a kid who's been bitten by a radioactive spider putting him in the, back in the high school setting where he's just kind of yearning to be in a universe that's big, a, bit, a bit bigger and he's had little tasters but wants to be given responsibility and taken seriously yeah. as a kid now that's I think that's what they were trying to do with the film it, for me it didn't quite work but as you know to paraphrase yes. William Goldman you know, making motion pictures is is such a difficult, difficult thing. Yeah. You know, for a motion picture to work, you have to have so many things absolutely being 100%. The script, the acting, the directing, the production design, the music, the editing. If any one of them is just slightly off, 
it can throw the whole thing. And I think the real miracle is that we have so many great movies that we do because they're mm. immensely, immensely difficult things to do. Absolutely. But getting back to where we started, you know, I went down to, I think, probably Shepperton rather than Pinewood, but yeah. I think it was Shepperton, and actually walking onto the Tracy Island set and they were filming <laughs> the scene where uh, the hood is, you know, invading the island with his uh, you know, cohorts yeah. like that. And it was just an incredible great. feeling. I love film sets anyway yeah. because they're such busy, wonderful places. But actually, you know, I'm there. Sir Ben Kingsley's over there. Yes, yes. Um, and you know, there's Jonathan Frakes, you know, Star yes. Trek Next Generation, of course, <laughs> you know, kind of like you know, them, you know, sort of like you know, yelling instructions and, and whatever, and actually being, you know, getting the chance to be part of that, and actually standing around, and actually, you know, I'm on Tracy Island, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, wow, and uh, and again, you know, what it was trying to do with the whole family feel as well. I think that's absolutely, you know, was the right way to try and go with that movie, yeah. even if it didn't quite, yeah. you know, work at the level that that's they right. hoped for. That's right. So then we fast forward a, a little bit of time, mm. and uh, you find yourself dealing with with Jerry's death in 2012. Yes. Yeah, it was that, tw- it was that long ago, That's 2012. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I remember I was actually in work working on a slightly different story um, that uh, it was day. Boxing day, yeah, it was Boxing Day. Yes, mm. uh, I tend to like to work over Christmas, mm. uh, actually, because it's uh, it's a bit quieter. You can get on with lots of things, yeah. and um, you know, I can get lots of stories on. And I remember, uh, you know, see, it probably came up first from social media, even then, sort yeah. of people talking on Twitter about how uh, you know sad that was. And I think we eventually got confirmation through because being yes. the BBC. You know, we're very, very careful with that kind of thing. We absolutely kind of like have to be, even though lots of people are talking about it mm. on social media or whatever, until we've got a 100% confirmation from a 100% source. Yeah. You know, we can't go and say, oh, isn't it sad that X has yeah, died? Because course. people take us so seriously. I remember Terry Gilliam telling me that... Um, when you know he'd heard a rumor from his daughter came in, you know, there's people saying that Heath Ledger's died, and the first thing he did is go onto the BBC News website sure. and say, "Oh, look, yes, BBC's saying it. Gosh, it must be true." That, that yes. was kind of like how he got confirmation yeah. that you know somebody that was in his you know Heath Ledger's final film, he filmed Terry Gibbon was doing yeah. the Imaginarium of Doctor Parnassus has died. So you know, which I think eventually we got confirmation from Jamie in yeah. the afternoon. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's always difficult because obviously you know a terribly sad time yes. for uh, for them, but he was you know wonderfully kind of like helpful and it's. It always is strikes me as you know, I, you know, the admiration of kind of like people who are going through one of the worst experiences of their lives, who's still going out of their way to help broadcasters yeah. and the media tell the stories that um, they need to, because of course, you know, we wanted to pay appropriate tribute to Jerry, yeah. you know, as we would be expected to. So I did the pieces for the national TV bulletins there, and, and of course, you know, we had such a wealth of material to. Mm. You know, choose from you know there be many worth. yeah there be many documentaries yeah. about Thunderbirds and everything and and what Jerry's contribution been and what he'd done so in a case it was how do you take all that and get it mm. into into two minutes so hopefully you know we got it right and um, you know very sad news for people to have over Christmas but uh, I'm sure it brought a smile to many people's faces it remembered as they brought back memories of their childhoods and and the real pleasurable memories that uh, they had of so many things because of you know Jerry's genius yes you know I was kind of one of those you know I was sitting there watching and just oh yes oh I suppose, oh yeah that stingray I mean sadly very often like someone's that. death is an opportunity to look back isn't it and yes. take stock where do you think sort of Jerry sits then in terms of the entertainment industry what's his, his sort of legacy oh he's, a, he's, a, he's one of the giants yeah I mean you know, really I mean Thunderbirds people still talk about and will talk about for decades mm. all those things Thunderbirds will live on Stingray will live on uh, Joe 90 I mean he is somebody who had an imagination that was way ahead of his time, a talent way ahead of mm. his um, time in making these things work. And it goes to what we were talking about a bit earlier. What he did was take, particularly with the uh, Marionette series, is take something which clearly wasn't a real person. Mm. You could see the strings, <laughs> but as a child and even as an adult, you were immediately invested in them as a character and you believed them, you believed in them, you wanted good things to happen to them, you wanted them to achieve their mission or rescue the people that were in danger. And that's what Jerry did. He, you know, had a beautiful, beautiful eye for just characters that you wanted to root for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much for taking time out of your very busy day. I'd just like to ask oh. you just a couple more questions. Yeah, no, absolutely. Firstly, what's it like being the interviewee for a change? It's <laughs> odd. It's not something... Uh, I think I enjoy being on the other side <laughs> uh, of the microphone, but it's great to be able to talk about 
stuff like you know, what Jerry did, a big part of my childhood, yeah. a big part of so many people's childhood. So it's you know it's you know a real pleasure and a real privilege just to be asked to uh, you know just to talk about yeah. him and, and reflect on that. And it's it's amazing how much it pops into different parts of um, your you know growing up experience as well. I was reading a few years ago. One of my favourite bands was Marillion. When right. I uh, when I was growing up, and I was reading in one of their biographies or something how they actually rec- you know recorded one of my favourite albums of theirs. The last, if you're in a Marillion fan, you'll know about this. <laughs> Fish, the lead singer of Marillion, left after the album Clutching at Straws because they went separate musical directions. But uh, they actually recorded that album. Uh, to, is it Bray Studios? Yes. And yeah. met Jerry and, yeah, he, sure and he showed them oh, round and everything. Yeah. And and actually for their next tour, for their sort of you know backstage passes and yeah. identification passes, Jerry actually gave. Marillion permission to use um, Thunderbirds Fantastic. characters as the for, the for the different parties. I think Fish <laughs> was Scott Tracy. So it's amazing how different parts of your yeah. childhood experience of things you love and enjoy suddenly end up linking together yes. like that. And you know that's what Jerry could do. I mean, I who would have thought you could link prog rock Marillion and Jerry Anderson? It'd be very interesting to see that Venn diagram. See what the intersections <laughs> like in the middle there. But it is you know, and just knowing that some of your musical heroes were as much fans of his that speaks yeah. volumes to yeah. the kind of man and the kind of talent he had and very lastly of all uh do you have any kind of you know tips for people who might be wanting to make their way into the entertainment industry or journalism i mean a couple of things perhaps uh i mean yeah absolutely follow your passions and it sounds like a bit old granddaddish these days it's in a way it's so much easier these days to express yourself with things you like Mm. you know things that i wasn't able to do when i was growing up but you can run a blog you Mm. can have your own youtube channel talking about all the stuff that you're passionate about and I would just say follow that passion um, you know, go for the things you really want to uh, I was lucky in that things worked out for me relatively quickly but don't necessarily take any in, you know initial knockbacks you know just if you've got faith in yourself keep pushing through because for me journalism has been and is a wonderful exciting thing to do I get to meet incredibly brilliant people and I don't just mean famous people I mean wonderful craftspeople behind the camera uh, behind the microphone who are so good at what they do and it's just a real pleasure just being able to you know chat to some of those people or share experiences um, with them so you know if you have the chance of having anything like the fun that I have had over the years wow just 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 go for it great well that's a lovely note to end on Lisa thanks so much for joining us I'll, uh, I'll let you go about your busy day thank you so much for having me it's been a real pleasure thanks Lisa Brilliant. Oh, perfect. Oh, Richard, thank you for doing that. I oh, love that. There we are. So you can see how brightly Jerry's influence shines in, in Lisa's life. It's amazing, isn't it? People yeah, from to, all walks of life. Yeah. And, you know, to to be so deeply uh, affected yeah. positively yeah. by those shows and have such fond memories, especially about stuff like the characterisation and yes. them being kind of real people that he could relate to despite the fact they were puppets that's right yeah Yeah. as he said it never occurred to him that they were puppets you know even though he could he said he could see the strings but even so it didn't it didn't matter they were real living breathing characters it's lovely isn't it yeah yeah Uh, and and he was one of one of many who when dad died he he tweeted out lovely lovely messages you know kind kind words and lovely things yeah him and brian blessed and jonathan ross and eddie izzard all these people so um, that's right yeah clearly one of the one of the big fans. Yeah, in the and as it, absolutely. And as you said, you know, obviously the death of Jerry's death was a very sad thing, but it's at moments like that you take stock of a of the whole career, and that's it's only then that you realise, you know, the huge influence that uh, that Jerry had in, in sort of popular culture, really. And, yeah, uh, yeah. But a lovely chat, really, very uh, you know, engaging interviewee. And, uh, it's, it's a really lovely time. So thank you for uh, for letting me uh, take over the reins for 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 one week at least. No, thank you for doing such an excellent job. I mean, do you want to do all of them now? Because well, it would save me some time, I mean, which would be busy great. Man, as you know, Jamie. But uh, oh, I know that's a problem, isn't it? Maybe every now and then you can wheel me out. <laughs> all right, fine. I look forward to wheeling <laughs> you out next time. Um, next week, mm-hmm. we have a long and wide-ranging interview with Wayne Forrester. Ah, now lovely. So tell us about Wayne Forrester. What's his connection to the Jerry Anderson world? For those who may not know, um, where do you start? Yeah, where do you start? I mean. Uh, I'm actually trying to work out where one does start. Where would you start? Well, I first met him at Pinewood 4 Space Precinct, of course, where he played various guest Mm. aliens. Uh, Yeah. Thunderbirds FAB, he did the theatre tour as well, didn't he? He was on the theatre tour, yeah. 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 And he worked with Dad on and off for a long time. Yeah. Um, And then, of course, he he came in to voice new Captain Scarlet in 2005. Yeah. 
and since then has done lots of other stuff. Uh, he's done some voice work for me, lots of big finished stuff. Yeah. Uh, and he's just a lovely chap. And I think I mentioned in a previous podcast that um, we actually had to stop stop recording yeah. at one point because it all got a bit emotional. Yeah. It was really lovely. That's it was great. Just, Great. So yeah, yeah uh, look forward I mean, to that. I mean, it's not great that you were in tears. I mean, it's great that you know. We, no, no, we have but you know, to such personal memories. That's what's so lovely, yeah. isn't it? Exactly. And there's some lovely stuff about Wayne getting introduced to uh, the shows by his dad. Yeah. So. Yeah. Nice. Anyway, there we go. So from uh, Wayne Forrester. Yes. To my cat. To your back cat. In the room. <laughs> yes. Hello. I know. I have fed you. And then segueing from your cat to the randomizer. Ah, uh, yes. Well, this is the section of the show when uh, we ask our uh, roving reporter, Chris Dale, uh, to sit down in front of a random Jerry Anderson episode from uh, one of the very many series that he produced and, uh, well, comment, uh, make things up as he goes along, tell us his uh, thoughts and, uh, yeah. Exactly that. <laughs> I'm just so, I'm being, I'm being distracted by my cat. Your cat's very excited <laughs> about the randomizer. Well, Kitty, wait no longer. Here it is. Goodbye, Marina. You won't have long to wait. Just until the clock on the bomb reads 15. Goodbye. Oh, I thought he'd never leave. Are you all right, Marina? Ah, don't worry, old girl. Soon have you untied. That's it. One more. There you go. What? Oh, the bomb! Right, yes, uh, I will get on and defuse that, and you can fire up the randomizer and select this week's episode. I think I brought the old uh, sonic screwdriver today. Here we go. Right, that's taken care of that. You know, when I took you on as an assistant, I thought we agreed that you were going to try not to get captured every other week. Hey, what are you smiling about? Oh, the randomizer's given us our very first Stingray episode today, has it? Uh, which one have we got? Oh, really? Well, yeah, I know it's one of your favourites because you're in it, but uh, it's definitely not one of mine. Ah, oh, well, here we go with Tom Thumb Tempest. Stand by for action. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Oh, this opening. This opening. It's, it's even today... This is still a spectacular piece of work, this opening title sequence. Imagine how how amazing it must have seemed in 1964 when this was first shown. You would have seen nothing like this before. Um, it, it, on British or American television, I can't think of anything, any opening title sequence of a show being produced around this time that looks even half as good as this. Even a quarter. This is spectacular. And uh, actually, one of my favourite memories of this opening title sequence is uh, being at Andacon 2014, sneaking into the viewing room to see the very first episode um, being shown in there. And obviously, I've seen the first episode of Stingray, like you all have, dozens of times. Uh, but I'd never actually... I'd never been to a viewing room in a convention before. I'd never sat in a room full of people watching the show. And when that opening title sequence started... And Commander Shaw went, stand by for action. And somebody went, woo! It just summed up the whole thing. It was like there was so much love in that room for this show. And when it got to the end of the opening title sequence, everybody in that room applauded. It was like, you know, we've sat through the opening title sequence. That's good enough for us. We don't even need an episode now because we've seen that, that brilliant opening. And it works every time. Even when it's attached to an episode that is... Uh, that is this episode, in fact. Uh, I will say up front, this is not one of my favourites. Uh, it's quite embarrassing, really, when you say to people, oh, yeah, you're a fan of the, the Jerry Anderson stuff. Um, can you imagine if you, you'd been telling somebody who knew nothing about any of these shows and they saw one of them on TV and it was this, you would be mortified. Now, here we are, as if... Anybody needed it spelled out for them. We're now in a dream. Um, the Jerry Anderson shows really liked their their dream episodes. I've always found them. I don't know because on the one hand, it's it's rather like the clip show episodes. It's in some sense a waste of a story to have something that basically just doesn't 
in the end t turns out not to have happened. On the other hand, it is a fun way to tell a different kind of story. Um, and certainly in some cases, uh, I think Lone Handed 90 is a really good example of them just taking that, that format and just running with it um, in a completely different direction. This one kind of follows along the same lines. But I I don't I don't like this one. Now, Stingray, um I think most of the other puppet shows had one two dream episodes at max. Stingray had I think three out of the thirty nine. Which is um more than you'd really need. Why is it the commander's going out of his way to make me look small? Now, as the uh, dialogue is hinting here, this is not only a dream episode, this is another of the Jerry Anderson favourites, the shrinking episode. Um, it, it's another peculiar fascination that uh, the earlier shows had. We had it in Supercar, we had it in Fireball, now we've got it in Stingray, and after this... With um, with Thunderbirds and Scarlet and Joe 90, you think, OK, they've, they've got that silliness out of their system and then they do a whole series about shrinking somebody. Um, I suppose the temptation would have been too much to resist to to have these puppet characters interacting with the real world, and the only way to do that is to do a shrinking episode. It's also probably um, somewhat more cost-effective to take these puppets and just film on a real set than having to build a, a puppet scale set specially for yet another story. I know, phones, but we are. We're in an aquarium. We're in an aquarium in a giant room. I do remember reading a, a review of the uh, Stingray DVD box set. Um, I'm not sure what website it was on. I think it was a, a review of the Region 1 box set that said... Um, they were reviewing the series. They mentioned this episode in particular, and they said that if the image of a puppet in a submarine in an aquarium suddenly realising that he's a puppet in a submarine in an aquarium doesn't make you smile, then you have no soul. Uh, I, I think that's probably the best way to approach this episode. Don't take it even remotely seriously. Um, I wouldn't go so far to say that it's clever enough to be a sort of meta-commentary on the the production of the okay, show. That would have been fun, actually, to have the characters kind of walk out of their own environment into like a television studio where they are a TV series that's being filmed, uh, similar to UFO's Mindbender. This, um, I, I can't actually remember off the top of my head who wrote this, but I would love to know how many blows they took to the head to make this episode a reality. Yeah, Marina. I seem to remember that name, too. The, the rocket emplacement on Balne Island. Y you remember. Uh, Nucello was the guy who captured us. That's it, Fons. We've just escaped with our lives. I do like this idea that uh, all the people who are going to be sitting around this conference table are previous enemies of the Stingray crew. I think that's a lovely yeah. touch. Um... It's a shame, really, that none of them actually show up, because it was very rare that um, any of these... that this show in particular had much of a, a sense of continuity. Obviously, we had Titan as the main villain. Uh, towards the end, we had a couple of... Uh, uh, what were their names? No Noctis and Gruber were in a couple of episodes, but they didn't really amount to much. And it's... It's great that all of these enemies that are on this table are the ones that you would consider the the more memorable one-off villains. Uh, Gadus, Nucella, um, was Maritimus on the table? Has anyone ever had a dream like this? Um, my dreams tend to be very, very boring. I've never had one as interesting as this. It's more like I dream about getting the bus or I dream about going to work. And here we have, reality has just cracked. We now have an aquafibium in a tuxedo. Making sure that a uh, dining table has all the cutlery. Oh, oh, that is so cute. The back of the tux is split so that the, the, the fins on his spine can show through. That is such a nice touch. 
yeah, that part of it, that part of this show, this episode is um, is hugely entertaining. Seeing the Aquafibians and X20 in their tuxes, and their ultimate evil plan for this episode is just put on a dinner party. That's it. Um, you could almost get rid of the Stingray crew entirely in that case. I would happily watch just that episode. Um, and that would be a, a nice um, framework for a flashback episode, I think, just to have these guys sitting around reminiscing about their, their defeats by the Stingray crew. You're in a giant room having dinner with Titan, with an Aquafibian as a butler and Stingrays in an aquarium. Have a good time. Will you get that guy, Giants? When it's all summed up in that kind of way, um, it does, as an adult watching this, it does help you carry, it does help carry you through the, uh, the fact that this is not very good. Um, because it's not meant to be anything spectacular. It is just a piece of fluff. Well-produced fluff, um... Yeah, yeah, this is just turn your brain off off time. Because if you don't turn your brain off, then the sight of X20 and an Aquafibian in tuxedos, oh my god, they have the bow ties. Oh, yeah, this is one element of Stingray that I I don't think gets as much attention or affection as it should. Is the Aquafibians? They are. Who told you to set fish knives and forks? <laughs> they are just lovely henchmen. Uh, obviously, they get um, mostly blown up in their terror fish, but they can alternate between genuinely sinister. There is something about the the bulging eyes, the teeth, the uh, covered in spikes. It's um. If you met one for real, it wouldn't be a very pleasant experience. But equally, they are so stupid. And in a setting like this, where they are... Th this one Aquafibian is just trying to to set the table, and the Stingray crew are ruining it for him. And he only has the one job, and he is doing it well. But the, the Stingray crew have just made his life hell. He probably transferred to the... Uh, to the Titanica catering department specifically so that he didn't have to face the Stingray crew in combat and get blown up and now here they are ruining his arrangement of knives and forks. Although actually going back to the placement of the table, those flowers take up like the entire table. Nobody would ever be able to have any food on that table because the... Look at that. That is just the whole table. You couldn't... Right, Titan cannot see his guests because of the size of those plants. Really, chaps, we need to rethink this whole thing. It's just not working. The matches. Put your foot on him, phones. I'll tear one. He said that with far too much relish. It's like ah, fire, my friend. You've heard so many horror stories over the years about uh, the special effects department's use of fire and how they were prone to like setting the roof on fire with massive explosions. I'm wondering how. We'll never get in, Stingray. It's too small. We got out of. How fires on the puppet stage would have been managed. Obviously, there would have been some of the somebody there with an extinguisher to make sure that this didn't get out of hand. But this having having a puppet scale set on fire with the puppets cruising over it on their monocopters. I mean, all it would have taken was for one of those wires to catch, and Troy or Marina would have um, come to a very fiery end. Much like uh, uh, late lamented Dr. Venus. Oh, we're back to normal size. Maybe. We're still no, you're not. You're smaller than you were just a few seconds yeah. ago. I'm trying to figure a way out. I can't. I can't apply logic to this. Logic is is taking a holiday. Troy, the water's heating up. And something interesting about the Jerry Anderson dream episodes worry, is boy. nine times out of ten, the dreams always ended with everybody dying. Which I always found quite strange. Um, Captain Scarlet, everybody died. In all three Stingray Dream episodes, Troy and Phones die. Uh, Joe 90, Lone Handed 90. Joe is at the, at the controls of a train when that crashes. Uh, 
and it was all a dream. And we end on a shot of Marina smiling, and I do like the Marina smiling, smiling puppet. Well, that was Tom Thumb Tempest. It was good to get that out of the way, I think, because this is probably one of my least favourite Stingray episodes, uh, along with maybe the other two Dream episodes as well, Raptures of the Deep and The Cool Caveman. Uh, the, the fact that they were able to tell a story that they wouldn't have normally been able to do, the fact that it is so weird and out there, doesn't kind of rescue it from the fact that it's just a, a huge pile of so what, really, like most of these Dream episodes are. Um, the Captain Scarlet did the Dream episode kind of well because the stakes were so high, the drama was so high. Joe 90 did a Dream episode where they actually learnt something that contributed to the series at the end of the story. This, you just watch it and you think, I wish I could have been watching you know, Titan and Terrorfish and undersea battles and interesting problems. This was just kind of... If I could go back and just replace these Dream episodes with, like, proper episodes, that would be lovely. As it is, not one of my favourites. Happy that we're past this one now. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, well done, Chris. Uh, another lovely randomizer. Assisting through that one, that's great. I mean, we've got another 300 and... Yeah. 47 or something episodes that could possibly come up so <laughs> who knows what we'll see next time <laughs> yeah. uh, good. but how about here's an idea what about if people at home uh, have an episode that in their wildest dreams the randomizer might pick that would be great if we could hear what your uh, favourite random episode might be if you were strapped down in front of the randomizer like Chris. Not that it'll have any influence on the mm, randomizer selection at all, but, you know, it'd be interesting indeed. for when it lines up. Yes. So do remember, you can get in touch with us, as ever, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk with all your ideas for our podcast. Uh, if you'd like to enter the giveaway, of course, which this week is, Jamie? Well, it's the first time we've done a giveaway. <laughs> Well, we've had sort of we've had various uh, offers on uh, posters. And we have had poster offers and all that sort of stuff. But this yeah. time, it is a prize package giveaway uh, worth two hundred pounds. Two hundred pounds worth of Jerry Anderson goodies. Yeah. You can get multiple entries by doing different things, like following us on Instagram and subscribing to the podcast. It may be that you've already earned a load of entries yeah. by already subscribing and rating and reviewing. So Wonderful. well done you! You're already one step ahead. Uh, so go to jerryanderson.co.uk/slash giveaway. Uh, to enter and find out more. Yeah, and if you enjoy, if you have enjoyed this podcast, then please do uh, subscribe to hear all future episodes, uh, rate and review us. That would be lovely. And of course, don't forget if this is your first time joining us, uh, well, you've got a wealth. There's at least seven other episodes to listen to. <laughs> In fact, there are seven other episodes, including this one stage. very short prequel. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so yes, are we done? Is that it? Well, I have no more to say on the matter. Um, I don't think I do either. No, but there's always next week, Pod 9. I know, Pod 9 with us and Wayne yeah, Forrester. That would be great. I'm very excited about that. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah, and we'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye, Bye for now. Bye. <laughs>I suppose I better go and feed the cat and let her out, shouldn't I? Yeah, you probably should do. I'm going to make sure that the kitten hasn't weed in her shoebox. Yeah, probably a good idea. Cheers then. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Richard. Bye. Bye bye.